Praise the Lord. I welcome you to a Bible study this good, glorious Monday in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will make us understand spiritually, not just emotionally or physically, the suffering that he went through for you and for me, for us, for the world, as we read the words and the account of his suffering in crucifixion today. And I pray that God will grant us the attention and the focus, thinking about Christ, thinking about his sacrifice, and thinking about all that he did for your salvation, for my salvation, for the redemption of the whole world. Thank you, and God bless you for being present at the Bible study. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this Monday. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the Bible study, which is the strength and the backbone of every child of God. And we thank you for the opportunity keeping us awake, alive, and healthy to participate in the Bible study today. We're asking, Lord, that your word will quicken us again, refresh us again, and remind us of the great thing you did for us in suffering for us on the cross of Calvary. We pray, Lord, that your word will penetrate every heart and convict every heart and bring us to closer relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're looking at Mark chapter 15. I was studying from verse 15 through to verse 32. I just read verse 15 to you, and then we'll read the rest of the verses as we go along in the Bible study. Open your Bible to Mark chapter 15, verse 15. And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Tonight, we're looking at verses 15 to 32, and it is the substitutionary suffering of the crucified Christ. Well, Christ is our Savior. Christ is the Lamb of God that takes the sins of the world away. How did he do that? How did he take our sins away? How did he bring forgiveness to us? How did he bring salvation to us? How did he come to reconcile those a humanity who has lost relationship with God, separated from God because of sin, because of evil, because of degradation, and because of the defilement of evil? We were separated from God. And the only thing that could happen is that somebody will bear our punishment, will bear our guilt, and will bear the condemnation that we merited because of our sin. Christ came to do that. How did he do that? Because he took the punishment we should have taken. He bore the pain we should have borne. And he took everything, the shame, the scorn, the speaking, the crown of thorns, everything we should have borne because of our sin. That's why his death, his suffering, and his agony was substitutionary. That means he stood in our place. He took our place in everything. He took our place before the Heavenly Father. And not just taking our place, uh, humanly speaking, but the divine wrath that shall come upon us, the divine suffering you know, that shall come upon us, the eternal suffering you know, that shall be upon us, he took away and took upon himself. That's why he was crucified. And that's why we're looking at it today, the crucified Christ, the suffering of the crucified Christ, the substitutionary suffering, the suffering in our place, the suffering for our salvation, the suffering for our redemption, the suffering for our reconciliation with God, the substitutionary suffering of the crucified Christ. 
As we look at these verses, verses 15 to 32, we're dividing the passage to three parts. Number one, the shameful scorn before his crucifixion. Not just that he was crucified. There was the scorning. There was the speeching. There was the shame. And there was the reviling. There was the reproach that he bore. And he bore that all alone. The shameful scorn before his crucifixion. Point number two, the substitutionary suffering on the cross. That's the only place he could bear the suffering. The substitutionary suffering on the cross. He had suffered the rejection in life. He had suffered all the degradation. He had suffered all the conspiracy. He had suffered the betrayal. But now, to really pay for our salvation and to pay for all that we owe, he had to go to the cross. That's why the suffering in particular on the cross is so important and so essential for our salvation. Point number three, the saving sacrifice of Christ. Actually, it was sacrifice because in the Old Testament, the priests had offered sacrifices to get to our forgiveness as they were looking forward to God forgiving them and taking the suffering of their sin, the punishment of their sin, and taking the eternal torment of their sin. Taking that away, they had to make sacrifices of animals. That's why they took the lamb. That's why they shed the blood. That's why they sprinkled the blood upon the lintels of their houses. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will know that an animal had died as a substitute for you. And because that animal has died, I'll take that to replace you. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now Christ was that final lamb, spotless lamb, sinless lamb. And Christ was the final lamb that came to do that and to accomplish all that the sacrifices of the Old Testament, all those sacrifices, what they were doing. He came to make the final sacrifice, and it's the sacrifice that saves. It's that sacrifice that sanctifies. It's that sacrifice that effectively links us to God and makes us totally reconciled unto God. The saving sacrifice of Christ. Let's look at number one. In uh, number one, we're looking at the shameful scorn before his crucifixion. We're coming back to Mark now. Mark chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, to conciliate or the people, and to please the people, release Barabbas unto them, and deliver Jesus when he had been scourged to be crucified. In verse 16, it tells us, it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall, called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. They didn't need to do that just to scorn him. And he called all the cohorts together, and he called all their band together, and he called all their company together. And then in verse 17, it says, it says, and they closed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. All this was to increase the suffering and to increase the pain that Jesus went through. In verse 18, it says, And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Of course, you know that was mockery. Of course, you know that wasn't coming from their heart as if they were giving honor and paying homage and paying respect and honor unto the King of the Jews. It was all to ridicule him. Hail, King of the Jews. And then in verse 19, it says, And they smote him on the head, remember, 
a crown of thorns around about the head already, and now they smote him, that crown having thorns that were sharp. And historians tell us, theologians tell us, that some of the pins of the crown was said like uh, seven inches or 12 inches long. And that was put on his head. And now they smote him with that crown of thorns on his head with a reed. And did speech upon him. Can you imagine that? How barbarous that was. Can you imagine that? How despicable that was. Can you imagine that? How shameful, reproachful that was. And did spit upon him, bowing their knees and worshipping him. Then in verse 20, it tells us, And when they had mocked him, it was all mockery. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. The shameful scorn before his crucifixion. There are three things we see in that passage we have read now from verse 15 all through to verse 20. Number one, the scourging of a substitute before crucifixion. The scourging of a substitute before crucifixion. In Mark chapter 15, verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them. Remember, Barabbas was a murderer. Barabbas was a criminal. Barabbas was a great sinner. Barabbas was the one that had raised up insurrection against the nation and against the leadership of the nation, political leadership of the nation. And yet they desired that that murderous criminal should be released unto them and that they should deliver Jesus the King, Jesus the Captain, Jesus the Savior unto them for crucifixion. But here is what Pilate did. He released Jesus when he had scourged him and then after that to be crucified. That's scourging. Look at Psalm 129 verse 3. In Psalm 129 verse 3, the plowers plowed upon my back. He made long their furrows. It's talking about, in prophetic language, the weeping, the stripes, the scourging that Christ will receive. And Isaiah tells us the same prophecy in another language, Isaiah chapter 50, looking at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I give my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked up the air. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Actually, all that Pilate did in scourging him, all that those soldiers did in spitting on him, all the shame, all the degradation, all the reproach against Christ, they were prophesied even before he came, that this is what our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, our Sanctifier, this is what he will bear for us. And now you see the fulfillment in the New Testament as they scourged him. You understand scourging is taking a whip and beating him with the whip. And they were told that what that whip actually had or contained a number of branches. And those branches were having at the tip end of each branch having sharp stone or sharp bone or sharp metal. So as they scourged him, it would tear off from his back part of the flesh at the back and it will be bleeding profusely. And we're told that among the children of Israel and the Roman laws as well, they couldn't give more than 40, more than 40 stripes. And therefore, 
generally were told, they limited the stripes to 39, just to make sure they do not go up to 40 or exceed 40. But remember, they tell us that those branches of the weep, sometimes there are 12 branches in the weep, and when you multiply 39 ways by 12, it's quite a lot. And that is giving us more than 400, 438. And as you look at that, you see all the stripes that he bought. And now the New Testament tells us the reason for those stripes as we come to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 who his own self is not an angel that bore the punishment of your sin or my sin or our sins. Who his own self is not Peter, is not apostle, is not Saint Augustine, is not any human being, no matter how religious, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that's on the cross. And it says that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. Look at this, by whose stripes ye were healed. By whose stripes ye were healed. He's telling us there that the stripes of Jesus actually gave us the healing. Number two, the scorn by the soldiers with a crown. That is, as they put a crown on him, it wasn't to honor him. It wasn't to reverence him. It was to scorn him. The scorn by the soldiers as they put the crown of thorns on him. It tells us in Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 18. Mark chapter 15, look at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole bunch the whole company of soldiers and the whole cohorts of the soldiers. It says in verse 17, as they called them together to come and view what they were going to do, they closed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon its head. They plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon its head the bleeding that will ensue, the bleeding that will come as a result of the crown of thorns that he put upon his head. And you know, they were not just gently putting the crown upon his head with bitterness, with hatred, with anger, and with wrath, with great indignation because they accused him to be the king of the Jews. They put the crown upon his head and the bleeding that came, all that he bore for you. All that he bought for me. And then it says in verse 18, in verse 18, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And you know, sometimes when people ridicule you, sometimes when they insult you, sometimes when they kind of make a caricature of who you are, and they say, okay, you are number one, okay, you are head, okay, you are great, and all that, but you know they're doing that out of scorn. You know they're doing that out of, uh, out of malice. You know how painful it is. But you know, this was not just ordinary talk of mouth. There was a crown of thorns on the head, and there was uh, going to be spitting, and all those indignities that were done against him. And now on top of that, they now said, Hail, King of the Jews. Look at Luke chapter 23, verse 11. It is recorded for us, again, what they did and how they did it. In Luke chapter 23, verse 11, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught. They made nothing of him. And they criticized him. And they said, he says he's king of the Jews. But they said, no, he's nothing. They called him in their derogatory language in nonentity because they set him at naught and they mocked him and they arrayed him with a gorgeous robe and they sent him again to Pilate. 
in the sight of Pilate and the soldiers. He had all this, um, all this reproach in the sight of Herod and all the soldiers. He had all this uh, ridicule. We're told in Psalm 22 that this wasn't anything surprising at all to the Lord Jesus Christ because he knew all things that are reaching concerning me will be fulfilled. And these have been reaching concerning him in Psalm 22, reading from verse 6, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. That's exactly what happened. You know, when you understand prophecy, and when you know this have been reaching concerning Christ, that for him to bear our punishment and to bear our degradation and to bear the consequence of all the sins we have committed, that this had to happen. Number one, it will not surprise you. Number, number two, the sin that will grip you is the fact that Jesus knew all this was coming. From all eternity, he knew all this was coming. While he was in heaven, he knew all this was coming. And yet he said, yes, I will. I will do the will of my father. I will go and pay the price for the salvation of humanity. There will be reproach, I'll go. There will be despising from the people, I'll go. There will be the crown of thorns, I will go. There will be the scorn, I will go. There will be the shame and the suffering as if he was a sinner, even though he would live a perfect life. And yet he said, I will go. What love for us, and what compassion for us, and what mercy for us, and what endurance to bear all the shame we should have borne in reproach of men, and this is the creator, this is the son of God, this is the very captain of our salvation, this is the ruler and the leader of angels, this is the one that when he came into the world, the father said, the angels shall worship him, and yet these soldiers, because of you, because of me, they reproached him and they despised him. Look at verse 7, in verse 7 it says, and all day, that see me, love me to scorn. You see that? All day that see me, they saw him on the cross. They saw him with the crown of thorns. They saw him with all the marks of the speeching on his face. And they loved him to scorn. And they shut out the leaf. And they shake their heads, saying, in verse 8, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him a sin, he delighteth in him. Again, what's the result? Why, why all that? Why did he come to bear all this? In Isaiah chapter 53, looking at verse 3, in Isaiah chapter 53, we're looking at verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's sorrowful. Not only, in, not only on the cross, in the world, all alone, because he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. He was rejected of men. A man of sorrows in the garden of Gethsemane. He was sorrowful even unto death, and acquainted with grief. And we did, as it were, we hid our faces from him. And uh, he was despised, and we stood him not. We hid our faces from him. All this time, as the crown of sons came upon Christ, where was Peter? Where was John? Where was the disciple whom Jesus loved? Where was James? Where were all the other disciples? We hid our faces from him. Where were you? Where was I? We couldn't bear with him. We couldn't endure with him. All that he went through, he did it all alone for you. He did it all alone for the whole of humanity. He was despised, as they said, as they said, Hail the king of the Jews. I will esteem him not. In verse 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs, when it says in the previous verse, a man of sorrows, a man of griefs, 
The grief is because of us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Hold on, smitten of God. I thought it was the soldiers that smote him. I thought it was because of Pilate or Herod, the smiting came. How do we say smitten of God? God allowed it. God ordained it. And God predicted it. And God demanded it because that's the smiting that should have come on you and on me. That's the agony we should have borne. That's the sorrow we should have had. And that is the grief we should have had because of our sin. That smiting, that affliction should have come on you and come on me and come on the whole of humanity. But because Christ himself volunteered and accepted that he will take our suffering, that's why it says, smiting of God and afflicted. It tells us in verse 5, in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. For our transgressions, it was bruised for our iniquities, for your iniquity, for my iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace, our peace, our peace, our reconciliation with God, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Look at the conclusion now in verse 6. In verse 6, all we like sheep. I've gone astray. That's like saying all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, look at this, and the Lord has laid on him, on our substitute, on him, on our Savior, has laid on him, on the final sacrifice, the Lord, the Father, has laid on him Christ, the Lamb, the iniquity of us all. And then he tells us in verse, in Mark chapter 15, verse 19 and verse 20, part of the shame and part of the scorn. Look at Mark chapter 15, looking at verse 19, and they smote him on the head with a reed and did speak upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him, saying in verse 20, what were they saying? And when they had mocked him, they took up the purple from him, and they put his own clothes on him, and led him out to be crucified. But look at Hebrews chapter 12, and see that in all that shame, in all that reproach, in all that spitting, what did he do? Look at this in Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 2. And it tells us what we should do. Now looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He should bring us to faith, is the origin of our faith is the foundation of our faith, is the creator of our faith, the author and then the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. By what he suffered, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He wasn't looking at all the shame. He was looking at the joy, the joy of your salvation and the joy of my salvation, the joy of bringing salvation to sinful humanity. For the joy that was set before him, the joy of being called the savior of the world, the joy of changing people, transforming people, linking them, transforming them, reconciling them with God, the joy of taking multitudes of people, innumerable, uncountable number, and taking them to heaven, and then being a trophy of his suffering. That's why he bought the speeching. That's why why he bore the crown of thorns. That's why he bore the contempt oh, for the joy that was set before him and endured the cross. 
despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now he's done everything. He's accomplished everything. And he said at the end, it is finished. The will of God has been done. The price has been paid. And he went up to be with the Heavenly Father. And now he sat down at the right hand of God, on the throne of God. We come to point number two now. Point number two tells us his substitutionary suffering on the cross. His substitutionary suffering on the cross. Eventually, he was crucified. And as he was crucified, he suffered, he bore the pain of that crucifixion. As we go through this section, verses 21 to 28, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the stranger forced to bear his cross. The stranger forced to bear his cross. In Mark chapter 15, verse 21, and he compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, and they bring him, they bring Christ, to the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted in the place of his call. Being interpreted, Golgotha, the place of his call. Now, as uh, Jesus Christ was carrying the cross, actually, uh, the cross was heavy. And it was uh, going, uh, and we can feel in all this part, in all this story, as we think and, and as we read about the bearing the cross. Now, they wanted to get to the place where they would crucify him uh, in good time. And they wanted the walking to be very fast. Why? Because they must get to that place at the right time because it was at the time of the Passover of the Jews. And because the weight of the cross was so much, remember, it's been bleeding even from the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed and the sweat as drops of blood came from his body. Not only that, he had been whipped with all those lashes and we know that it was weak. Now the crown of thorns upon him, it was drained completely and was tired completely. And bearing the cross was not something easy. Now, yes, he still bore it, but he was walking and it was too slow for them. That's why when they found this man, they grabbed him and they put the cross on him so he can walk faster and get to the place of crucifixion. We're told in John chapter 19, verse 17. John chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 17. It says, And bearing his cross went forth into a place, bearing his cross. He was the one bearing the cross. But because they found this a stranger called Alexandra, that's why they took the cross from him, walk faster, walk faster, and then they put it on him. He bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of his call which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. It tells us in chapter 23 of, of Luke. Luke chapter 23, and we're looking at verse 26. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross, and that he might bear it after Jesus. That he might bear it following after Jesus. But why is all this recorded? You know, in Mark, we're even told he's the father of uh, Rufus and is the father of uh, Alexander. The reason we're told is so that we'll know. This event eventually brought him to think about the cross. He was a stranger, he was a Cyrenian, and now he came as he was coming out of the country. They just grabbed him and put the cross on him. That made him inquisitive. Who is this? Why the cross? 
And why did they crucify him? And when they got to the place of crucifixion, he saw everything that took place. And then what was he going to study later? How for three hours the, uh, the sun withdrew a shining and everything became dark. And now Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All that brought some curiosity on this man. And eventually he came to know the Lord. We're told in Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Romans chapter 16, looking at verse 13, it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. He went back home and he told the son Rufus, This is what I saw. And they believed on the Lord. And it says, And his mother and mine. They came to the faith because of what had happened to this stranger in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 24. It says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you? And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Dear Cyrenian, dear Simon, and filled up what was behind in the afflictions of Christ. Like Paul the apostle, and he did that for the body's sake, for the church, for you and for me. And when we are called, to bear the cross today, we don't know what consequence that will come eventually. It will bring salvation, it will bring enlightenment, it will bring the gospel to other people as well. So don't uh, dodge the suffering that might come upon you as you are assisting Christ in filling up the afflictions of Christ. Let's come to number two now in Mark chapter 15. Reading from verse 23, Mark chapter 15, verse 23, the scriptures fulfilled on the cross. It says, and he gave him to drink wine mingled with mirth, but he received it not. In verse 24, it says in verse 24, and when they had crucified him, they parted his garments and cast lots upon him what every man should take. And he wasn't dead yet. He was still on the cross. And he wasn't dead yet. He was suffering. He could hear what he was saying. He could see what they were doing. What do you think? If a man was really sick, if a man had terminal sickness, but not dead yet, and he could still hear what people were doing, he could still hear what people were saying, and while he was yet alive, although dying, they were already sharing his property. They were already saying to his hearing, I will take that, you will take that, I will take this other one, we will take this. How would you feel if you were a man like that? Well, that's what happened to Christ. That's why he was crucified and still on the cross, and he wasn't dead yet. And all these people that didn't contribute anything to his ministry, they're already parting his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And then look at verse 25. It says in verse 25, and it was the third hour, and he crucified him. Verse 26 tells us, and the superscription of his accusation was reaching over the king of kings and the king of the Jews. And then in verse 28, verse 28 now, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says it was numbered with the transgressors. The scripture was fulfilled, which says it was numbered with the transgressors. They counted him like a transgressor. They looked on him like a transgressor. They treated him like a transgressor. And yet Christ understood because the scripture had prophesied, proclaimed, predicted that that will happen. The scripture was fulfilled. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, and one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar. 
and put it on a reed, and gave him drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. All this was done so that the scripture will be fulfilled. Look at Psalm 69, verse 21. Psalm 69, verse 21. He gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst he gave me vinegar to drink. In my thirst he gave me vinegar to drink, prophesied by the Lord, by in the Old Testament, and yet everything fulfilled on Christ. If something had been prophesied, like in the Psalms, about a thousand years before even Christ came, and it was fulfilled to the letter as Christ came to fulfill that prophecy, you understand, number one, that the scripture is the word of God. You couldn't prophesy, you couldn't predict something a thousand years before that event, and it will be fulfilled if God was not in it. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And we're told in Psalm 22, reading from verse 16. Psalm 22, we're reading from verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Remember once again, this reaching about a thousand years before the coming of Christ. And at that time, there was no punishment given to any criminal in any country, in any nation by crucifixion. And yet, that crucifixion had been prophesied even when crucifixion was not a form of punishment in the land of Israel. That assures you this is the word of God. That assures you too that the crucifixion of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the substitutionary suffering of Christ was not accidental. It was all prophesied before the time. It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. In verse 17, it says, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, they patch my garments among them. You remember? That's what we just read in Mark chapter 15. And it had been prophesied many years a millennium, a thousand years before it happened, they patch my garments among them and they cast lost upon my vesture. Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, it assures us here that this was done so that prophecy will be fulfilled and so that he will take many who will believe on him out of their sin and he'll bring them to salvation. Therefore, will I divide him a portion of the great and he shall divide the spoil of the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Made intercession for the transgressors. How did Christ look at this? How did Christ understand all this? The bleeding, the spitting, the smiting, the crown of thumbs, the scorn, the crucifixion, the pain, the agony. How did Christ view all this? Look at Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 44. It says, And he said unto them, 
These are the words which I speak unto you. He was risen from the dead now, and his disciples came around him, and he reminded them that the shame and the spitting and his cunning was not an accident. And he said, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. All things to the minutest details must be fulfilled. All things in the Psalms, in the prophets, in the writings of Moses, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, concerning Christ, concerning his suffering, concerning his crucifixion. Before we leave this part, let's come to the superscription fixed on his cross in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 25. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. In verse 26, and the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. You remember, we've read it before. Let's just refresh our memory. In uh, Psalm 2, verse 6. Psalm 2, verse 6, it says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's the heavenly father. That's the almighty. That's the ancient of days declaring that Jesus is son of is the king, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zechariah chapter 9, looking at verse 9. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the full of an ass. I was told in Isaiah chapter 46, reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 46, reading from verse 10. The assurance that the Bible is the word of God. No other book has prophecies from the beginning of that Bible to the very end of that book that will prophesy. And some of those prophecies 4,000 years before, 3,000 years before, 2,000 years before, a thousand years before, 700 years before, and hundreds of years, 400 years before, those things happened, and they happened into the details. No other book like that in the world. But because the Bible is the word of God, and God is the one that is the final, eternal author, that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. That is, all these things that happened to Christ, they were not yet done when the prophecies came forth. And yet it says, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So then you understand everything that happened to Jesus Christ, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the captain of our salvation, the author and the finisher of our faith, everything was according to God's specification, 
and prophecy, and everything was fulfilled according as it had been written. And your salvation to be fulfilled, your reconciliation to be fulfilled as it has been written. As you turn away from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior, the appointed Savior, the anointed King, and the approved Savior, giving for all humanity, giving for you and giving for me. He is the Savior, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the word of God. It is written, it will be fulfilled. The moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation, redemption, eternal life, forgiveness, freedom from sin will be yours. Eternity with God will be yours. We'll come to point number three now. In point number three is the saving sacrifice of Christ. This sacrifice is a sacrifice that saves. It's a sacrifice that sanctifies. It's a sacrifice that sustains us in the grace of God. This sacrifice is the sacrifice that attaches us, reconciles us with God. This sacrifice is the sacrifice that gives us initial salvation today that gives us sustained salvation as we go on in the Lord and gives us final salvation as we close our eyes here and, we'll open, and we open our eyes in eternity. This is the sacrifice that gives us total, complete, entire salvation for spirit, for soul, and for body, the saving sacrifice of Christ. In Mark chapter 15, verse 29. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Look at verse 30. They said, Save thyself and come down from the cross. He could have done that, but he would not. If he came down from the cross to prove his power, how would you be saved? How would I have been saved? How would anyone be saved? All they were saying, the search contradicts the purpose of your coming to the earth. Cancel the purpose of your coming to the earth. Negate the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning you in the Old Testament and save yourself and come down from the cross and save yourself from all the suffering so that the scriptures will not be fulfilled on you. And then we will believe that is something Christ would not do. They were ignorant. They didn't understand the purpose why he came. That's why they were saying what they were saying in verse 31. Verse 31, likewise also, the chief priest mocking said among themselves what the scribes, he saved others himself, he cannot save. That's true, that's true. He saved others himself, he cannot save. That's exactly the reason why he's able to save others except a corn of wheat will fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if he falls into the ground and he dies, he'll bring forth fruit, multiplied fold of fruits. That's exactly why he's saving. Because he's not saving himself, because he's not avoiding the cross, and because he's not running away, from that grief and sorrow and suffering, that's exactly why he's able to save us. He saved others. Himself, he will not save. He gave his life. Look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe that we may see and believe what they're saying, that Christ, 
the king of Israel, the son of God, disobey the father and descend from the cross and deny the will of his father, then we will see and believe impossible. Christ was not going to disobey the father or deny the father or deny the cross or push away the cross just to make people believe he will go through to the final conclusion so that he will please the father and his sacrifice will be acceptable to the father and thereby salvation will come for you, for me, and for the whole of humanity. And because they will not do that, it says, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. And let's look at three things. Number one, the piercing malice of cruel slanderers. The piercing malice of cruel slanderers. These were people having cruelty in their hearts, having cruelty in their language. That's why they were slandering him as they pierced him. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, it says in verse 30, save thyself and come down from the cross. Look at that verse 29 again. They said, thou that destroys the temple. He didn't say he was going to destroy the temple. And he wasn't talking about the temple. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up again. And he spoke concerning his own body. Did they understand? Yes, they understood. After he died, these same people went to Pilate. They said, that man, when he was alive, he said, after he died, he'll rise up the third day. Therefore, let his stone be put upon the tomb so that his disciple will not come and steal his body away and then say that he has risen from the dead and the last error will be worse than the first. They knew what he said. They only slandered him and said, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. It was just slander. And let's come to Psalm 22. He knew that would happen. In Psalm 22, reading from verse 7. Psalm 22, verse 7. All they that see me love me to scorn. They shoot out the leaf and they shake the head, saying in verse 8, it says in verse 8, he's trusted on the Lord that he will deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. It tells us in verse 13. In verse 13, they gaped upon me with their mouth, as a ravening and running lion. In verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Psalm 69, verse 20. In Psalm 69, verse 20, reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none for comforters, but I found none. In Psalm 109, Psalm 109, reading from verse 25. I became also a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shaked their heads. Lamentation chapter 1, verse 12. In Lamentation chapter 1, reading here in verse 12, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by, can you only mock? Is it nothing to you? 
all ye that pass by, can you only shake your heads? Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, can you only slander? Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, can you only shout at me that I shall contradict the desire and the will of my Father to come down from the cross? Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold and see. If there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me, the Lord has afflicted me. He was meeting and he was afflicted by the Lord for your transgression, for my transgression. Where is the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. That anger should have come upon us, upon the whole of humanity. But he bore our sorrow, our grief, our suffering, our punishment. And then he tells us about the mockery of the priest. The second section now in Mark chapter 15. Verse 31. The priest's mockery of the crucified Savior. The priest's mockery of the crucified Savior. Likewise, like all the other people have done, the ordinary people, the peasants, the passers by, this is exactly what they had done. They had mocked him. The priests also, they joined in. Likewise, also, the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others himself. He cannot save. Uh, so they understood. And so they knew that he went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He saved others from Satan. He saved others from sickness. He saved others from affliction. He saved others from judgment to come. He saved others from their sin. He saved others and forgave many. He saved others himself. He cannot save. Yes, he saved others because himself he will not save but they were now mocking him in verse 32 in verse 32 let christ the king of israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe thank god christ never did anything to make them see christ never did anything just to make them believe he will not do unrighteousness to make people believe. He will not contradict the prophecy of the word just to make them believe. You know, there are people that will tell us to do something so they can see and believe. If you believe that the word of God is true, if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. Here is poison, drink this, and we will believe. We don't do things like that. We don't do what sinners and what unbelievers are calling upon us to do just to make them see something, and then we're contradicting the Lord and we're tempting the Lord. It says, they said, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Don't make sinners deliberately see anything. Don't make slanderers deliberately see anything. Don't make all those uh, people that want you to contradict the word of God see something and they say, if we see this, they will believe. Don't do that. As they said, they send now from the cross that we may see and believe. And then they that were even crucified with him, they reviled him. They reviled him. It was all mockery of the crucified Christ. Again, let me remind you that this was not coming by surprise at all. We're told in some two reading from verse 1. Some two, we're looking at verse 1. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? How is it the scribes? 
that knew the scriptures and the scribes that knew where Christ, the king of the Jews, will be born. And they pointed that out in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And they had said that to Herod when he was demanding where the king will be born. And now they were mocking and they were imagining a vain scene. What's the vain scene? That you'll come down from the cross and then they'll believe. It says in verse 2, in verse 2, it tells us the kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Against his anointed. The anointed, that's the anointed one, that's the Christ. See in, uh, in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, let us break the bounds asunder and cast away their cords from uh, us. Let us break their bands asunder and cast their bands asunder. It says in verse 4, it says, He that seated in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. A laugh for those people that will ever think that the Son of God will obey Satan and disobey and deny his heavenly Father. He loved them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. And look at uh, Psalm 22, verse 16. In Psalm 22, reading from verse 16, For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. In verse 17, I may tell all my bulls. They look and stare upon me it tells us in first peter chapter 3 first peter chapter 3 here is the reason why christ went through all this and he didn't come down from the cross and make them believe he, he stayed on the cross so as to make us believe it says in first peter chapter 3 verse 17 for it is better if the will of god be so that he suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Christ suffered for well-doing than for evil-doing. Christ suffered for our salvation rather than for our damnation. Christ suffered and remained there on the cross to assure us and to purchase our redemption and to assure the Father all the price for redemption and salvation, reconciliation, all the price has been paid. And that was better, to suffer in that will of God and to give us salvation. Verse 18, in verse 18, for Christ also has once suffered for sin, not his own sin, he had no sin, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. It tells us in a third section here, the preeminent mandate for our committed substitute. The preeminent mandate for our substitute. Committed, consecrated, commissioned substitute. He was to be our substitute. And because he was commissioned for that, and he was uh, constricted for that, and because he was committed and consecrated to that, that is why he suffered the way he suffered. Look at the way he had committed himself to that in John chapter 18, verse 11. John 18 verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? He was not looking at all this coming only from Pilate or from Herod or coming from the chief priest or coming from the members of the Sanhedrin, or coming from the conspiracy of the council, he looked at it from the perspective of 
predicted events, prophesied events. This is the call which my father has given me and it has been prophesied in the Old Testament that to cancel the Old Covenant and bring in the New Covenant and bring salvation to not only the Jews but the Gentiles and the whole world for me to be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Here is what has to be done. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? It was to be a substitute and was committed to that. It was commissioned for that. That is why he took this preeminent mandate and was going to go through. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18, for as much as you know, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But, it tells us in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's how we're redeemed. That's how we're saved by the blood of Christ that is shed for us on the cross of Calvary as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In verse 20, in verse 20 it says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Verily and truly, actually, assuredly, it was foreordained, it was a predicted preeminent mandate for him. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you, for us, and this is why he suffered. We're looking at Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now, to him that is of power to establish you, establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. In verse 26, it says, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It had been a given even from the foundation of the world, a mandate for Christ and Christ counted that mandate as preeminent that's why he will not look at the shame, he'll not look at the scorning, he'll not look at the spitting, he'll not look at the reproach. He was ready to carry out that predicted, prophesied, preeminent mandate with real consecration and commitment as our substitute. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 3. In verse 9, it tells us there, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world, from the beginning of the world, has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, is to make us see now, is to make all humanity see now, the mystery that had been kept from the beginning of the world, hid in God. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, to the intent for the purpose that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. Christ giving his life for the life of of the whole world. That's the manifold wisdom of God. And in verse 11, it says in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, according to the eternal purpose, 
which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, Christ Jesus our Savior, Christ Jesus our Redeemer. This is the eternal purpose that God the Father had purposed in Christ our Lord, our Redeemer. He is the appointed substitute, appointed sacrifice, and the saving sacrifice for the whole of humanity. He was committed to that, and he took that as the preeminent mandate. And let's uh, round up with Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, looking at it from verse 3. This I've been reaching concerning Christ. Can you find out in the word of God, now that you are saved, now that you are sanctified, and now that you are servants of God, is still word of the mystery of the gospel? Can you find out what has been written concerning you and take that as the preeminent mandate in your life, the prioritized mandate in your life, the proclaimed and predicted mandate in your life, and like Jesus Christ was committed as our substitute to that preeminent mandate, everything that is written for you, concerning you too, as a saint of God, as a child of God, as a servant of God, you take that mandate and you make it preeminent in your life. Whatever Pharisees say, whatever Pilate may say, whatever any herald of today may say, whatever Satan or the cohorts of Satan or evil people may say, they might say, do this, go to the right, go to the left, come down, go up or do that, and then we'll believe you will not do whatever, you will not say whatever, you will not go in any direction that the people of the world, that a persecutor, that a slanderer, that a sinner, that a man of the world, that a man, a woman of the world may say and demand of you to do, your eyes all the time will be on that preeminent mandate, will be on that prescribed mandate, will be on that proclaimed mandate that the Lord has given to you and you'll be a committed saint. You'll be a committed servant of God. You will be a committed son, child of God. Anywhere and everywhere, whatever the degradation and whatever the defamation and whatever the persecution and whatever may be happening around you, you will scorn all that and you will turn away from all that and you will set your mind and set your focus on Christ and the word and the mandate the Lord has given you and in that way you'll be following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that preeminent mandate he was always looking at. That's the reason why he didn't do what those landers said he should do. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Then in verse 4, he tells us in verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. And afflicted in verse 5 it says but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes were healed the healing of the nations and the healing of his own children and the healing of the sick and the healing of every generation was so important to him uh, that mandate that he will provide for the salvation and for the healing of those who are sinners and those who are sick, that mandate that he will provide for salvation and healing was the most important for him. Uh, that preeminent mandate was the focus and the attention of his life life and the same thing with you whatever is the mandate of God for you and whatever is the preeminent and proclaimed and prophesied mandate for the child of God that will be the priority of your life it says in verse 6 in verse 6 it tells us all we like sheep have gone astray we have 
returned everyone to his own way. And it says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Us, the Gentiles, us, the Jews, us of this generation, us of every generation. That was so important to be the savior of the whole world in every generation. And then in verse 7, it says in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8 tells us, it says, he was taken from prison to prison, and he was from judgment to judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was caught up out of the land of the living. Why? He was caught up out of the land of the living. I said why? The why is there for the transgression of my people was he stricken? That was his attention. That was what he was looking at for the transgression of my people was he stricken. In verse 9, it says, and he made his grave with the wicked and, the, and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, because he had committed no sin, because he has done no evil, because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In verse 10, it tells us, yet he pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin. He shall see a seed, and it shall prolong its days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his son. That was his concentration. That was his con consecration. And that was his commitment that the work of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the pleasure of the Lord, the uh, sin the Lord had ordained, the mandate of the Lord will prosper in his son. And then in verse 11, it tells us, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's what was looking at, the satisfaction that the will of God had been done, that the salvation of humanity had been purchased, and that redemption, reconciliation with God had been made possible, that by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. He shall bear their iniquity. Now in verse 12, it says in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. You can be among that many. He bear the sin of many. You can have salvation through that, sanctification through that, purity of heart through that, holiness of heart and life through that. He bear the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He made intercession for the transgressors. It's made intercession for you. And it's making intercession for you now that if you are not saved, you'll be saved. If you are saved, you'll be sanctified. If you are sanctified, that the sufficient grace of God, the abiding grace of God, the multiplied forged grace of God will be upon your life. And in every situation after your salvation, you, you'll be able to say, His grace is sufficient for me. And that's what Christ has done. Today, we've looked at Christ as that sacrifice. We've looked at Christ at that substitution. We've looked at Christ as a sin bearer. We've looked at Christ as the one that came to take our sins away. And as we reflect on what Christ has done, and you believe on what Christ has done. You accept the salvation he has purchased for us, and you accept everything Calvary has purchased for you, for me, and for the whole of humanity. 
Why don't you stand up now and recollect everything we have learned? And as you recollect everything we have learned today, then you bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. All you have is a word of appreciation. It's a word of thanksgiving. And it's a word of a grace that God could do this and allow his son, his only begotten son, to pass through all this for your salvation. Talk to the Lord now and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Everything that ought to be done for your salvation has been done. Everything that Christ had to do has been done so that your salvation will be a real, purchased, personal, property, possession for you. Call upon the name of the Lord, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can call upon the Lord now. You are not having any sacrifice before you are saved. You are not offering any other sin before you are saved. Just my son, give me your heart. Give your heart unto the Lord and come to the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind and say, Lord, I accept. Lord, I receive everything you've done for me. You bore my sorrow. You bore my shame. You bore my suffering. You bore my punishment. All the evil that I've done, all the violence in my hand, all the sins I've committed, I bundle everything together. I present to you for a great exchange. You give me your righteousness and you take my unrighteousness. That it will do. That it will do. Call upon the Lord and have the assurance that he does not reject anyone. Why? Because he suffered for everyone. No matter how far you have gone in sin, no matter how deep you have gone in sin, even if you did it intentionally, knowingly, he, he suffered for everything. There is no shape or shadow and there is no size of any sin that he has not atoned for. His death is the atonement for your sin. Thank him for that. Accept that. Receive that. And believe for the salvation he has purchased for you. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's salvation. And then the peace of God will come to your heart. And the freedom from sin he'll give unto you. All the habits of sin, the power of his cross will break and shatter and make you a new creature in Christ. A new creature in Christ is done it for you. Shame, he bought that scorn, he bought that slander, he bought that sin, he bought that consequence of sin, he bought everything scourging. He bore everything scorn. He bore everything spite. He bore everything. Now you can be free. Accept. Believe. Receive. And confess that you know he has forgiven you. Now go in the strength of that salvation. Go in the grace of that salvation. Live in the righteousness of that redemption. And he will always be with you. He suffered for you to give you salvation. And after giving that salvation, he abides with you. To make you victorious over the sins he has forgiven. Thank him. Acknowledge his presence with you. His peace with you. His purity with you. His power with you. I'll make you victorious, overseen, make you an overcomer. Thank him now. It's done. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for the revelation of your word and for making it clear to us today how Christ bore our sin and all the consequences of our sin. And Lord, as we lay hold on Christ in faith, by faith, 
We pray, Lord, the assurance of salvation will come to everyone who repents and believes on the Lord Jesus right now in Jesus' name. By grace are we saved through faith. We pray that that faith will be real, will be living faith, and the grace of God will come along with it, and there will be testimony in every heart that we are saved in Jesus' name and the power and the strength to remain free from the sins of our past. You give us that grace. You give us that power that will live victoriously and righteously for the rest of our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses of this salvation, of the suffering of Christ to other people, so that those who have not known will hear and know and believe, and they too will be saved in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, every time to appreciate the salvation, to acknowledge the salvation, to abide in the salvation, so that the victorious life, righteous life, the redeemed life will be ours, and so that a holy life, a sanctified life, will demonstrate every time in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, as you have answered our prayer and will abide in that victory and will abide in that strength and will abide in that righteousness until you come for us to come to heaven. And we pray that until the day of your appearing, we remain faithful, walking with you in righteousness with the confidence that you have saved us from all our sins and we don't continue in sin anymore. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and make his grace to abide in your life until we see the Lord face to face. In Jesus' name.